Let's talk for a minute about configuration. When we created Como MTA, we wanted to follow the concept of configuration as code. And what that means is that rather than using fixed text configuration files, we've instead used Lua as a scripting language in order to configure the software. That gives us a lot of flexibility when it comes to trying to set up how software works, how your configuration is stored. We've worked previously with a lot of different MTA solutions, including open source and commercial. And one of the things that becomes a common use case for a lot of senders is the idea that they have to create include files, populate those include files using things like scripts that are reading off of databases, put those files in the right place, and then send reload commands to the servers. This gets large, complicated, and convoluted in a lot of cases. I've seen personally senders that I've worked with that have had just directory after directory of includes where they would create, for example, one directory for each of their customers. That directory would contain an include file that might have their IP information, might also have their DKIM signing information, various other sources. That concept becomes very con very difficult to scale because you're constantly editing more and more files. That means there's, there's a large number of files that have to be kept track of, that have to be connected to, all coming from what could just be a queryable data source. Now, when you use configuration as code, you get kind of the equivalent of both options. So I'll show you later on here what that looks like, but it means that you have the ability to do things like query data sources directly in order to get configuration information. And because it's executed as code, rather than having to have the entire configuration prepared and written down in files at start, you can instead dynamically load information as it's needed for a given use case. So traditionally, you'd have an MTA, it would start up, it would have to pull in IP information for every tenant that it uses, every you know virtual MTA or whatever it's called, and store all of that in memory so that at any given moment it has access to the configuration required. When you do this as configuration as code, you gain the ability instead to have the software, Kumo MTA, query and determine the configuration necessary for a given scenario at the time that it's needed. And that information is cached, but when the cache expires, if there's no additional messages that need that configuration, that configuration can be gone out of memory until the next time it's needed. This means that you're able to do things like not have to issue any reload commands typically. Instead, the software simply queries when it needs information, keeps it as long as necessary, purges it out when the cache expires. If you change things in between, that change only takes as long as the lifetime of the cache, which is typically one minute, before that information is going to be retrieved again and is going to then apply going forward. So that's why we chose this approach. It makes it a lot easier to do some very cool things, but at the same time, I'll talk about it in the next video, we've introduced the concept of helpers to bring that simplicity back for those who simply want to edit some files in order to manage their config. Going down, as we work in configuration, one of the things to keep in mind, there is a single init.lua script that is run at startup. This is typically located in optkumo MTA etsy policy init.lua. That's the recommended location. It's not actually mandatory. It is possible to start the server using another location. As far as how we set up our configuration, some of the scopes that we're going to work with you'll see here, it comes down to how our queues are managed. So we're going to have the ability to set up listeners, whether that's over SMTP or over API. Those listeners are going to accept messages, make decisions around them. They're going to load those messages into the scheduled queue. The scheduled queue is defined as a identifier that is the campaign and the tenant, and also a combination of the domain that message is being sent to. So for every single one of those combinations, you're going to see a separate queue. So your, your tenants are never blocking each other, your campaigns are never blocking each other, and your traffic to one domain for a given campaign intended is not block, blocking traffic to another given domain for that campaign intended combination. All of that is then loaded through the queue maintainer. The queue maintainer takes that scheduled queue message, which is where it sits while it's waiting for its time, whether it's on first attempt or on retry, puts it into the ready queue. Ready queues are based on where it's coming from, the source, as well as the 
site name, which is a fingerprint of all the MXs for that particular domain. That means that if you're sending to a hosting provider that may host thousands of different domains, rather than having those each in their own separate domain queues, they're automatically going to be rolled together so that that MX set has a queue specifically for that destination MX set. It makes it a lot easier to apply throttles correctly, makes it a lot easier to manage queues when you're actually representing all of the messages that are going to a single set of MTAs at a given provider. That allows us to do our throttling and control our throttles based on that destination. From there, the messages are delivered. We have egress pools, which are a collection of what we call egress sources. The egress sources are the IPs or other pathways that are going to be used to send messages that belong to that pool. The messages are assigned to that pool, and then from there, they can be round robin through those egress sources. All right, so from there, main things to keep in mind here. We're going to set up things in our init.lua, some of which are relatively fixed, so they would occur one time, which is things like setting up our logs, setting up um, just other options that are essentially one-time startups. But separately from that, things like listening on IPs, what domains that we're allowing to relay through from what sources, what kind of throttles to use, what those egress sources and egress pools are, all of that information along with things like tenant assignment are all done dynamically by querying from the config file. So from there, the main thing to understand is that those are the, the scopes that we're going to be setting up our configuration for. After that, we look at the structure of our config. So like I said, we have an init event. That init event has those standard things, setting up the spool, setting up the logs, things that are fixed and that we don't expect are going to have to be changed dynamically during normal operation. So these are things that are going to require a, a server reload if we are changing anything that's inside of that init handler. We'll show you some examples of that when we get to the example server policy. From there, the rest is real time. These are things that are going to adjust based on events that occur as a message is flowing through the server. So for example, we're going to get a message in and it's going to say, hey, um, you know, we got to set up the config for this queue. It's got a destination domain, a tenant, a campaign, what we're routing through. We're going to create a config for that and we're going to tell it things like, all right, I want this to use a certain egress pool. I want this to have certain adjustments made to the message. One of the key things I was talking about though down below here is this idea of external data. So when you look at the configuration file that, you, that we have in the example, which I'll show you in a minute, you're going to encounter things that look very much like a fixed and static config. You're going to see things like, for example, for DKIM signing. All right, we want to set it up to, if this is the, the, the destination or the source domain, I should say, the signing domain, use this selector for that, for that DKIM signing. But because this is configuration as code, it means that anything that we can implement using Lua we can then use as a way to configure the server. So instead, we could do this. We could say, hey, we're going to be loading a JSON file located at this location into our DKIM config variable. And from there, when it's time to do a DKIM sign, we're going to say, okay, I want the sender domain from the header of the from header. I want the domain from that. And then I'm going to do a query against the index inside that DKIM config looking for that particular domain. And that's going to give me the selector. We can go past that and not just do things like loading from JSON. We can query things like SQLite. We can use key stores like HashiCorp Vault in order to store that information instead. So we have a lot of flexibility as a result of this config as code concept. We're not going to go deep into what that example policy looks like in this video, but I want to give you a little bit of a feel for it. So it starts out as a very straightforward Lua script we're just taking in some some extra requires here that are helpers. We're going to talk about helpers later and that give us the ability to to just do some of this in a more simple way, as long as you're comfortable with trading flexibility for simplicity, because the helper is going to implement in a very specific way rather than giving you the ability to do that more dynamically based on on your individual needs. But you can always use the helper scripts as a jumping off point to modify and then to convert to your particular implementation. From there, it turns into something relatively straightforward. So we're saying, okay, here's where our shaping config is. Here's some of our options for it. Here's that init function that's going to be called once for startup. We're gonna set up our spool and it's very simply, this is the name of it, what path it goes to, what kind of spool we're using, in this case, RocksDB. It could also be straight to disk. We're going to set up things like our local logging. Where's the directory we want them stored? How often do we want those logs to rotate? 
based on size, based on time. We're going to set up our bounce classification, and here's where the configuration for it is. Here we are setting up our listeners. So this is for API, two of those. Below that, we set up for SMTP. So we're saying we're going to listen on any IP that's available inside of our interface. We're going to do that on port 25, give ourselves a host name, and we're going to allow these two hosts, or ranges in this case, to inject mail and be able to relay that information by, relay those messages by default. We'll accept that traffic because it's coming from that network. We also set one up on IPv6 and started configuring things like webhooks for logging information. And then we get into our helpers, which are very simply going through and saying, all right, I want to set up the listener domain combinations using the helper rather than manually implementing that in Lua code. So I'm using the helper and here's where I've got the configuration file for how those two should be associated. Same thing happens with the rest of our helpers, whether it's things like setting up traffic shaping rules, setting up which IPs we're using, the egress sources, how they associate, setting up our tenants and queues to automatically assign, and then do our DKIM signing using a helper as well. All of that very simply, very straightforward, allows us to have a very short and simple core init.lua. This is all the Lua script that this particular server implementation has. And in addition to that, there's about, let's see here actually, one, two, three, four, five. There are five different configuration files that are then called and associated with those helpers for each of these. And they can be things like Toml, they can be JSON, it's up to the user as far as that goes. But all that has to happen at this point is those get populated and that information is then used through, again, editing of those Toml files or JSON, which makes it very easy for you to either manually edit or create automated processes that populate those files. So very simple, very straightforward. And that's how you're able to use config as code to make configuring a Kumo MTA instance either as simple or as in-depth as you want it to be based on how deeply you want to integrate into your larger environment and your configuration management system.